Money can buy you happiness. Always look at like money will buy you happiness if you share it. Mm. You understand? Because you can't be a drug dealer and don't help out the people around you. Mm. That makes sense. You got family and everybody else trying to survive. And you, you got to help. You got to have a heart, even though what you're doing is wrong. But it's, it's a way to survive. Mm. When I was young coming up, my parents never told me go to college. I, I never got the dream. Mm. My dreams were gone long time ago. Mm. So I never, ever got the dream. So if I'm not having the opportunity to dream to be a doctor or a lawyer or be something beneficial for me as I grow up, what was I going to do? Yo, what's poppin'? It's your boy, Mr. J. Hill, and welcome to another episode of the J. Hill Podcast. But right now, I want to give a special thank you and shout out to our sponsor, that's Top Dog Law. So look, man, if you're suffering from medical malpractice, a slip and fall, especially a car accident, make sure you call my guy Top Dog Law. That's Top Dog Law on Instagram and topdoglaw.com. Look, if you check out his Instagram, you'll see he uploading big checks. I mean, like, every day. I ain't talking about the little ones. The big ones. So shout out to my guy, Top Dog Law, topdoglaw.com. Get that money. I know I'm trying to get it. Hey, what's poppin', man? You know what time it is. Your boy, Mr. J. Hill, J. Hill Podcast. Special guest in the building today. Um, This is a special episode. We got up early in the morning. It's like... Seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, my guess, her flight was probably at like at least five o'clock in the morning. So this is super special. Uh, a good friend of mine, Will, got the juice. He called me, said, "Hey man, my mom, she got something going on. She wrote, she wrote this book. She trying to do a press run. She want everybody to know about this book. And who better to do it than you?" And I'm like, "Of course, let's do it, man." Uh, from West Baltimore, Baltimore City, just like myself. Um, she wrote an autobiography of her life. You know what I'm saying? These are the stories that we need to hear, especially as, as young people, because these are the stories that were before us that helped create us, that helped mold and ship who we are today, that helped ship our thinking. So this right here, y'all know I don't even give introductions like this, man, but this is so special because this is like interviewing my moms, right? Like this is, is special, man. So I just want to... Um, Welcome, Miss Beverly Queen. How you doing? Thank you so much. How you doing this morning? I'm good. I can't That's complain. Good. You looking good. You look Thank prepared. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. I oh man. It. So um, I guess us talking about you is really talking about the book, right? Yep. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. So what what made you book. say, man? I'm ready to write this book. It's a project. First, I had to live the life. Mm. Then once you live the life then that's when you lay back and said, say to yourself that other people need to hear this. Mm. So that's what made me write the book and the trials and tribulations I went through as a kid growing up. It had to be told. Mm. But what made you say, you know what? This is the time right now. I think because of the simple fact that what I went through as a kid growing up, more and more children are going through the same thing mm. and the book needed to be heard to help other children that's going through what I went through. Mm. When you say um, we're going through the same thing. Bullying. Mm. It's like you you can't call it a race thing but the bullying was so out of pocket until you was literally not liked by other African-American young kids growing up because your skin was a little bit more lighter than the average young child that was growing up. And it was hard for me to comprehend in life going through the trials and tribulations because of the color of my skin. Mm, isn't It's crazy because, like, I would think that... Because when I was coming up, it kind of was like normalized to make these jokes of like we always made fun of the light skinned one or the dark skinned one. And I really didn't understand that. So now that you're here, you probably can explain that um, furthermore for me, because how was that for you? Right. Like we coming up, we thought it was just a joke. Like, are oh, you light skinned? So we used to call the guy soft or you light skinned. So this and that. But I can only imagine the things you had to actually go through. Like, how was that? It's painful and it hurts. 
Mm. It's it's just episodes in your life like you say to yourself, when will it end? It's no ending. And we this happened in 1985, 90, and 70, and we still going through the same thing. We mm. all are human beings. At the end of the day, let's treat each other fair. Mm. Where do you think that come from if you had to pinpoint it? I think it comes from one generation or one kid may not look or present their self in a manner where an, the way another kid may do it. Mm. So I think it affects them in some kind of way, but they it's it's just a reality check. They really don't know what you literally be going through. Mm. It's 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 a headache to be bullied every day when you come in home from school. It was always somebody there to beat you up. I literally got bullied from the time I was in elementary to middle school. And it literally forced me to drop out of school because I had no interest in school no more. Mm. Wow. It's no, bullying is no joke. It's even at a higher level now than it's been ever before. No, it is. Do you think, um, what about the relationship with your parents? Were you able to have that conversation with them and they understand? I couldn't. Wow. I couldn't. I could not go to my parents and be like, I'm going through this at school because they had their own things they were dealing with themselves. I came from a family uh, where my mother and my dad, um, my dad would abuse my mother mentally, physically, and drain her. So if you're abusing her and beating her up every day, how in the hell are you going to take the time to see what your own daughter was going through. Mm. I came from a family of nine sisters and brothers. It's like, it it was no outlet. I had nowhere or no place to turn when I needed somebody to talk to. It was nobody there. Mm. My best friend in chapter three was a red blanket. And that red blanket I would take with me everywhere I go was my outlet and that was my friend mm. because it didn't bully me and it didn't bother me. And I was out playing on the park one day and I forgot it. And so when I came back the next day to get the blanket, the children, the same ones that would bully me, burnt it mm. to ashes and then told me what they'd done when I got to school that Monday morning. Wow. Life shouldn't be like that. In that moment when, when, when he said that he burnt your uh, blanket, how, how did that make you feel? I was lost. I was lost for like days. But the night before, when I had came from the playground, it was getting dark and I asked and I got in the house. I said, oh my, I said, I left my blanket and I asked my mom and dad to go get it, but they wouldn't go get it. Mm. So, yeah, it hurt because that blanket was like my friend. Before we even get to them burning the blanket, right, let's talk about the the creation of the relationship between you and the blanket. It was my comfort. Mm. It, did, it didn't disrespect me and it didn't argue with me. It didn't knock me around the way my father would do me. My father would beat me. My father would beat my mother. Mm. So if that blanket is my comfort zone, something I could cuddle and hold on to, I didn't need my mother and my dad at the time. Wow. So let me ask you this, because usually when we see things that are different, right, we, we tend to reject it. So how, how was your parents taken to you having this blanket, calling it your best friend? My mother loved it mm. because it was something that made me comfortable. She always washed it and always kept it clean for me. Mm. So they were not against me carrying that blanket wherever I went. Wow. That's, 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 that's dope that they embraced it. Yes, they did not bother me on that behalf. But your friends kind of probably teased you for it. Yeah, they wow. done it. Yeah. And then you leave it at that playground. Mm -hmm. You come back the next day, they said they burned it. Burnt. They told me when I got to school that Monday morning, they told me they had burnt it to ashes. Was this when you said, I'm done with school? Or? No, I was in elementary. Oh, you was at, still in elementary I was still in elementary wow. school when they started. The bullying started from elementary, and it went all the way to middle school. So being in elementary school, your best friend, the blanket, which is the blanket, right, it get burnt. Mm -hmm. That gives some type of, like, heartache, uh, pain, trauma. Um, how were you able to get through that? I didn't. Mm. I started getting angry, and and I was not in a good place because it was like I didn't care no more. 
it's just like with anything. Once you take something from somebody that means so much to somebody, they're hurt and they're in pain. Mm. Wow. And it was taken away. And then the bullying never stopped. I figured by the time I left elementary that it would stop, but it it followed me all the way through. Mm. And then the being beat up every, it's like every every Friday at a bus stop somewhere, I was always getting fights and always getting beat up. It was so bad I even took uh, a knife to school me one day and they, they called my dad and told my dad, you have to come and get her. Wow. That's how bad it was. And we talking about in 1969 or 70, hmm. And that was back then compared to 2022. Yeah, it's to the year we in today. Dang, it's just crazy because it's like the life, they say life is like a revolving door, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Everything Mm -hmm. that's happening now Mm has been happening before, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder how, no, you get, it's fine. Take your time. Will, so we doing it now, Will. So I'm gonna call you back. All right, cool. So you have to bring a knife to school because it's to the point you're getting bullied and you need to protect yourself, yep. right? Isn't it's, it's crazy because, like, it's like we're put in these environments, right? We have to protect ourselves, and then we're penalized for protecting ourselves when we haven't really had the proper tools to teach us how to, I don't know, even maneuver through life like this. Right, like we just dropped on, we don't know, right? Our parents probably not paying us no mind and we're trying to tell them, but we feel like we can't be here because especially during those days, I can I could, I could, can only imagine how it was. It's like, go to school, do what you got to do, right? Like if somebody bullying you, like whatever, ignore them, you'll be okay, right? Okay. Sheesh, so in that moment when you get, you get sent home for having a knife, like are you feeling like just by yourself, no hope? Like what's going through your mind at that moment? A lot was running through my mind, and I felt like it, it, was no, it was no hope. It was like, how would I protect myself if they know now that I have the knife, mm. and now it's gone? I have no protection, mm. and I felt so lost. And no matter what I would do to try to protect myself, it, it, the pain would never go away, and the bullying never stopped. Mm. So having so many sisters and brothers, you would think that like you would have some protection. Yeah, right? that's what I thought, too. So where were they? Wasn't there to help me. Mm. Sisters and brothers wasn't there to help me. So did that that I create a did that create a divide between you and your um siblings? No, because it 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 created a divide in the world we in today. We still don't have the connections, and we're still not close to one another. Yes, we have been divided for a long time. Dang. And it's like nine sisters and brothers. No one wanted or could protect me. You talking about? Really? No, no one protected me. So you 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 kind of felt like I'm in this alone. Like the black sheep almost. Yep. Right? I was yeah, I'm I was definitely the black sheep of the family. So how did that so cuz I, I still want to stick to the story, but let's fast forward a little bit, right? Cuz you have you have children. How did that affect you in your direct family once you started to create a family of your own? I protect them more. Mm. And I didn't put my hands on them. Right. But were they clo- but were they close to their aunts and uncles or no? No, because it started generating again. Mm. So if you don't care for me, how are you gonna care for my children? Mm. <laughs> it's, it it never stops. It's like a never ending cycle. Yes, right? it's a cycle. But you have to take your children and you have to protect them from them because it gets no better. So gets, I mean how do so I hear it gets no better, and I can under, definitely understand that. How do we, being the generation after you, right, how do we make a change? Like, can we even make a change? Like, How, how do we live a different life and have, so that don't happen to us? You have to make a change. I think if we took the time to love one another more and care for one another mm-hmm. more than oppo- opposed to the way I came up in life, because my parents never told me they loved me. I never got hugs. Mm. So if you start doing that now and be understandable of what your children are doing and understand the concepts of life, of how things should be as a parent, 
then I think you would do much better. Yo, this episode is sponsored by The Morning Meetup. Man, shout out to my guy David Shines, man. He's probably one of the few people I know who actually built multiple multi-million dollar businesses, right? He created The Morning Meetup to help other entrepreneurs do the same thing. Now listen, as an entrepreneur myself, I know how hard it can get, especially when we start making money and we get to like this financial cap that we can't get past. And honestly, let's be real. They say it ain't what you know, it's who you know. We probably can't get past this cap because we either, one, outgrew the people around us, or two, we just being lazy and weighing in the rooms we need to be in. It's just plain and simple. But trust me, this is your time because the morning meetup is that room we got to be in. It's filled with, filled with entrepreneurs getting to it. They reading different books every month, right? They holding each other accountable. And it's just honestly just something dope to be a part of. So listen, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to get to this bag, you're trying to flourish more than you've been flourishing now, you got to go to the morningmeetup.com. That's www.themorningmeetup.com and join now. Let's get to it. I'll see you there. Because I had to protect my children and give them the love and support that I never got. Wow. No, that, I think that's that's definitely deep. And not and, and not get too consumed in our partner and our work, right? Like you got to focus on them children. The children, it, it's, like, it's like you got to do it because if you don't learn how to protect them who's going to do it mm. then they fall in the cracks right you got to remember you got to remember we in a generation of the day this generation of the day is not the generation that my generation was and then we had that middle generation where a lot of them were born to mothers with a whole lot of stuff and grandma and aunts and everybody raised them mm. so it's it's a different way of life and you can, you, everybody else, we can make the change, but you got to take the time and the patience to do it. And I always say that four letter word, love, caring, and understanding and respect of one another, mm. it helps out a lot. Mm. So f- fast forward to today, it looks like you're, you're doing pretty good for yourself. It looks like you're successful and things like that. You got this book, this wonderful book that you wrote. When did... Or how was you able to transition into having a better mentality, right? Like not not seeing everyone out to get you, but to understand that this was a certain particular time in my life and I have to continue to, to move forward to be successful. How When did you start to transform into that mindset? I had to live the life in that book first and mm. get past the hurt from that book. Mm. Because that book, may, when you read the book, the book in... In that book, that book tells you more that you, what I became. Mm. I lived in poverty. I was a, I was a drug dealer, kingpin drug dealer at like 28, 29 years old. Mm. I came up poor, rats running through my ceilings, roaches. My father would lock the food up in the refrigerators while he went to work. Mm. We couldn't even we couldn't even get proper nourishments of food to eat. So what do you do? I'm dropped out of school, pregnant at 16, raised a daughter, tr- trying to raise a daughter and survive mm. off of a job. I didn't do welfare. Welfare never could could couldn't do anything for me anyway. So I knew I had to go to work. Mm. So when I when the money that I would make, it wasn't much was not supporting me. I started dating drug dealers. And then when I started dating drug dealers, that's when I became a kingpin myself. Mm. How was that? How did you get into it? You dating a guy? I started off selling drugs at 18 years of age Mm. on my own. But did he put you on? Oh, so you started by yourself? I started before I met him. Okay. What What made you go down that road? I took that road because of the situations I was living in at home. Right. Who wants to be broke and poor? Right. Nobody was not giving me anything. It's like you fend for yourself. Mm. Wow. So you meet the guy. Is this is the, the guy that's um or you already had your daughter at the time? I had one daughter at sixteen, 16 yes. Right? And th- was this from like a relationship that you thought was for you or something that no. you didn't work out? You have I at the time when I had my daughter, I had my daughter to be honest with you for comfort and love, to give her the love and comfort that I never gotten. Mm. Wow. And was our father still around or? The father was still around. Okay, okay. So 16, you have your daughter. You're trying to find your way. You're trying to be a mother. You don't even know how to, you're still trying to be a woman yourself. Yeah. Right? How hard is that? It was hard. 
Like, what, what was some of the, the the what's the first lesson you you thought you learned as a uh, as a woman as a mother, right? Raising this 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 little girl into becoming uh, just to growing as a woman. Responsibilities. Mm. I had to learn. I literally had to learn how to be a mother to her, and put what I needed to be done, and I had to put that aside. Mm. Wow. Well, how did the? It's, it, I'm curious to know how did the trauma, right, that you saw from your parents, how did you ever see that seep down into the relationship between you and her? Because a lot of times, we, we intentionally act like the trauma that we saw or we encountered, right? Did that ever happen right. to you? Did you ever notice that or no? Right, but that's the trauma. This this is what happened to me. The trauma never stopped. Mm-hmm. Because when you come from an abusive, re- you're, you live in a home where so much abuse and violence, you get relationships the same way. Mm. So I was I was physically abused by a man also. Right. And his best friend was Muhammad Ali. Wow. And Muhammad Ali became my head. Oh, wow. So whenever he felt like he wanted to punch something, my head was there for him to punch. Walls or anything. Wow. And I'm assuming that could, like... That became like normal for you. Yeah, it's a normal thing. Wow. For what? some reason, I don't know why. It's like once we're in a home where we see daddy do it to mama or whoever, do we think it's cool? I think we think it's cool to go and do it, mm. but not knowing it's hurting us at the same time. But it was times where it like really hurt mentally and physically, right? Yeah. So yeah. what made you stay? Why didn't you just say, I'm, I'm gone? You cannot walk out of an abusive relationship without having a plan. It mm. don't work like that. Because at the end of the day, he's going to kill you and something else is going to happen to you. Mm. You have to have a plan. So I had to have a plan in order to leave that relationship. So once he went to work, I was gone. Mm. Because they keep coming back for you. You lucky if you get out of it. Mm. Wow. Okay, so you have, have you, did you... When you had your first daughter, right, did you catch yourself, I guess, I don't know, maybe, like, beat, beating your daughter because things she probably wouldn't listen because that's not what you was you used to? No? I couldn't do it because mm. I know if I would beat her the way my father beat it me, I would hurt her. Mm. And that's one thing I wouldn't do to my children. Okay. Okay. I mean, so it's crazy because that, it is, not saying, I'm not w- hope, wishing this on nobody, but. Something does come from the pain. Something good does come from the pain, right? Because it's like we 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 see these these harsh things, these harsh punishments, and it's like I would never want my child to feel how I felt. Right. Right. That's what you be thinking. Yeah. Mm, you don't yeah. want to send your child through what you went through. Exactly. Went through. You don't want your child going to bed with no food to eat. Mm. Um um um. Uts potato chips. I should have put stock in them mm. and Coca Cola soda because that was my meals. That was food that we would have for dinner that night. But it's, 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 I guess we could say, one could say that that pain created a great mom in you. It makes you stronger and makes you not take the steps that they took. Okay. So let's go into this relationship, I think, at 18, right? You, yeah. You, you, you struggling at home. Things is unorthodox. You don't like it. You're like, man, I need to get some money. Mm-hmm. So I was like, man, I'm about to go to the streets. How was that? How did you... How did you get introduced to Ben's in the streets? Did you have somebody, a friend that was on the corner that was selling drugs? Like, how was your? It was first around us. It was all around us. Mm. So you just be able to go outside, and say, "Hey, I want to." <laughs> so what was it though? Like, was it? Cause you can you talk about this? Did you talk about this in the book? Like, was it weed? Was it what? Was it? It was cocaine. Wow. Sheesh. And once you get, I would get tax money, and work money, my job money, and right. I would buy me drugs and i would give it to someone else to sell and i was doing that at 18 years of age oh but i mean cocaine back then that back and i mean still even today right like um oh there's no statutes of limitation I'm, are you good you, you okay, okay to talk about this okay <laughs> so like that brings a lot of money though right mm-hmm. because then it took me to after i start doing it on my own it took me to a step to deal with bigger drug dealers mm. So I, I dated one drug dealer that was larger than life, and I dated him for about seven years. And then when I went there is when I dated another guy that was from Jamaica, and he was a big drug dealer also. Mm. And then that's when 
he was um, from Jamaica and immigration wouldn't allow him to stay in Baltimore. Wow. So I took the drug business over. So that's how I became. Did you run into them? Um, because we had some big drug dealers in Baltimore. I stayed to myself. So okay. if you run some of them, some of them by me, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even know a lot of them because we dealt with people that we knew, and it wasn't a lot. I I was so isolated when I was doing that business. It was crazy. Wow. So when you met your, your boyfriend at eighteen, you was already in a game. Yes. I was, I, I was doing it before I met the one at 18 years old. So he was, dark, but he was doing it too. But he was large, yes. He was already large, yeah. Okay, okay. So I guess he helped you take your empire through the roof. Yeah, of. yeah, yeah. It gave it gave me a leeway in life that nothing is stopping me right now because I may be living in the same poverty home, but I'm not broke. I can afford to do some things that I want to do. Mm. So now we go from... Rags literally to riches, right? On yes. My, on our own, right? Yes. What is your, what is your, what are you thinking at this point? Or is it like, all right, I'm finally out of this. I'm never going back. Like, where are you at right now when you, when you, when you making so much money or kingpin, you got this boyfriend that's larger than life? Like, what, what is your mindset you at You think that different. You think like you in a world, when you live in large like that you in a world in a state of mind like you can't be touched mm. you can't be touched it's nothing out here i cannot get or buy because the money is there for me to do it with mm. so let me ask you this question then they say um money can't buy happiness can it money can buy you happiness I always look at like Money will buy you happiness if you share it. Mm. You understand? Because you can't be a drug dealer and don't help out the people around you. Mm. That makes sense. You got family and everybody else trying to survive. And you, you got to help. You got to have a heart. Even though what you're doing is wrong, but it's, it's a way to survive. Mm. When I was young coming up, my parents never told me go to college. I, I never got the dream. Mm. My dreams were gone long time ago. Mm. So I never, ever got the dream. So if I'm not having the opportunity to dream to be a doctor or a lawyer or be something beneficial for me as I grow up, what was I going to do? Mm. Nobody never told me the, the right things or the wrong things in life. It's like you learn on your own. Mm. Wow. Okay. No, nah, so, I mean, that's this is so interesting because, like, you, you really get the – to to hear it or see it and in person, right? Like you're telling me a story, and I can almost visualize it, right? It's like a movie. Like next thing you know, you're gonna be making a movie. <laughs> from it. <laughs> so, um, at, did you? What? Why did you stop? Did you get caught? Did you get arrested? I got busted. Mm. I got busted. It was on a Thursday evening, and um, I remember to this day, it's like it just happened. And um, I got busted with 12 ounces of 99% cocaine mm. that I was taking to a guy that I hadn't dealt with in a long time. And he got in trouble, and that's how I got busted. Usually when people get, like, you hear these uh, these stories that come to an end, you hear some sort of, like, f fantasy of they know they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. In that moment, did you have any thoughts of, like, I shouldn't be going here or this is too much. Yeah, it came at me and I tried to tell I tried to tell my husband. I was like we haven't dealt with him. We shouldn't deal with him. But business was slow. He would say we need to get rid of it. Mm. So we dealt with him. Wow. Then y'all yeah. get busted. Or you just you get he didn't get busted. No, because he couldn't never come back to Baltimore. Right, yeah. He was still He had to live in New York because immigration was always on his back. Wow. So you get busted. Like, how does that change the the dynamic of the relationship between you and him? That stopped me. Okay. But how did that change the relationship between you and him? Because, like, you told him, like, yo, don't, like, we shouldn't do this. Do it anyway. Did that, did you have any hatred, any resentment? So, gradually, after that happened, I knew the day it happened that I was not going to jail and I was not going to lose my children. Mm. So, <laughs> I took another road. I went to jail, got out of jail. Jump bail, went to Jamaica to live, mm. and then about two or three years later came back to Baltimore and turned myself in. Wow. 
because I couldn't leave my children. Mm. But I ended up leaving them, but I left them for a short period of time. Wow. Because they never wanted me. They knew he was he was the target of it. Wow. So were they able to catch him or? Not to this day. Wow, this is crazy. This is this is super interesting. So, at this moment, you you had both. You had, how many children you have? I had two children and one I adopted. Okay, so at this moment, you got two the two children, right? Um, you had well, Will in Jamaica, or you've been you had Will in Baltimore, and you moved to Jamaica. Baltimore. Okay. Will is Will Will is Baltimore. Right. So you moved to Jamaica, but you come back. Yes. Right. Yes. So. How, how? But before I came back to Baltimore, I went to Texas, chilled out in Texas for about a year. Oh, you were just on a run. You was just, <laughs> you was just, you was just top uh, fugitive. Like, dang. So okay, you go to Texas. Then I go to, I dip. I go to Texas, and then from Texas, that's when I, my 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 brother, was sick. Mm. He said, "You need to come home." I'm like, "Come where?" He said, "You need to come home. I'm sick." Mm. So he said, come home and turn yourself in and help me out. And that's mm. what I've done. Mm. If not, I probably, I probably, I don't even know where I would be at if he would not have made that phone call. How much time you had to do? Like, how much time you ended up doing? I can actually say to this day, I walked away almost scot-free. Because mm. I went to jail for about a year and long enough to wait for a trial date. Mm-hmm. Then when I went to court, then that's when they only gave me five years probation, and I knocked it out, and that was it. Okay. Hey, wow. How does this affect the relationship between you and your kids? Because they probably didn't even understand what was going on. My my kids, <laughs> my kids understand me. Mm. And once your children understand who you are, that 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 allows them to love you even more. Mm. Because they know what kind of parent you are and they know what you've been through. Mm. But if you get children that don't understand and don't care for nobody but themselves, it's a whole different story. They know what I went through in life. Mm. I have no secrets when it comes to them. Oh, so you was like open, pretty tra- transparent. Yeah, you have to be. Mm. Dang. Before this somebody is- else come along and tell them and turn it upside down. But I said, let me just go do it myself. This is good. I mean, I hope if this don't get you to want to read the book, I don't know what 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 will. Like, this is pretty good. So, question: Who would you say the audience for this book is? Is it for somebody like me, or is it for like older than me? Like, what, what's the audience? For? That book is for anybody who wants to read that book. I don't think it's sitting the audience for any age bracket or anything. Of course, no young children or something like that shouldn't be reading it. But someone that's of age that went through the same thing that I went through in Baltimore because you mm. got a lot of them that was in Baltimore doing the same thing. Mm. How, how how do you explain Baltimore to somebody that don't, that haven't, had never been, but they only seen The Wire? Like, how would you explain it? Baltimore is a piece of work. Mm. It's a lot. There's a lot of challenges in Baltimore. It's not a bad place to live. Would I go back there to live? No. Mm. Because the crime and stuff is out of control. So who wants to raise children and grandchildren there? Mm. Would I go to live Baltimore today in 2022? No. Mm. But if you would have caught me back when I was younger, yes, I would, because it was a good place to live. Mm. But it's changed a lot. Oh man, listen, man, this is uh, the biography of Beverly Queen. I think um, this is definitely a interesting read. You have to read it. It's dope. Uh, I mean, this is. This is only a, a tad bit of the story, right? Like, yeah, it would take all day for us to go through that book. Mm, mm, mm. Man, I, I appreciate you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate so much. your time. Uh, let's make this a bestseller. All righty. I hope. I pray to God support me and buy my book. Uh, man, this is a great conversation, man. Biography of Miss Beverly Queen. Make sure you support her right now. Where, where can they buy you that? <laughs> Um, I'm, it's everywhere. Everywhere. It's Barnes everywhere. and Noble, everywhere. Yes, Barnes and Noble, Amazon got it. Oh, bookstores have it. It's even in the UK. So it's all over. Korea, China got it. Everybody have it. If you go to Google's and put put the title of the book in there, it's a whole list. Target got it. Walmart got it where you can pick it up. Mm. Make sure you go get this book, man, right now. Right. All right. Bev is the biography of Miss Beverly Queen. Miss Beverly Queen it was an honor. It was a pleasure to have you. I appreciate you. Um, anything that you want to leave the audience with that we didn't touch on? Nobody is perfect. Mm. 
everybody got trials and tribulations that they do go through. Mm. Support one another and love one another. Nobody's perfect. Support each other, man. Biography of Miss Beverly Queen. Miss Beverly Queen, J Hill, J Hill Podcast is a wrap. We out.